Without ambition, there can be no innovation. Without ambition, there can be no grand vision. Without ambition, there can be no struggle. And without ambition, there can be no victory. From the first days of the Cold War, humans' ambition has reached outward to the stars, as the most powerful nations, leaders, and innovators across the world have sought to break our final terrestrial boundary. Across the globe today, 77 world governments have their own space agencies. 16 have the capability to launch spacecraft. Five, plus the continental European Space Agency, have the ability to land on extraterrestrial bodies. But of every nation on this planet, only three have brought a living human being to space. The United States, Russia, and China. Of those three nations, two of them, the USA and Russia's predecessor, the Soviet Union, brought their people to space during the Cold War. That game has been well documented, and though it is now finished, Russia and the US both reap its rewards to this day. China, however, has taken a very different route to the stars. In the past 30 years, its space program has gone from a handful of ballistic missiles to its current status as a pioneering organization and a leader in spacefaring technology. Known as Project 921, it's China's long-term journey to human spaceflight that takes the center stage today. At the forefront of China's global ambition, the center of its science and technology education, and the leading edge of its innovation, Project 921 has been a central mission that has helped guide China into its status as an emerging superpower. On April 24, 1970, the Dongfang Hong-1 satellite reached orbit around Earth. Weighing in at 173 kilograms, just below 400 pounds, and carried to space on an indigenously produced Chinese rocket, this chunky little thing had just two tasks to complete while in orbit. Sing a patriotic song and announce the time. But despite having a limited mission and nobody to sing to in the vacuum of space, the satellite was a major proof of concept in its day. Made in China, launched with materials manufactured in China, and under the sole control of China, Dongfang Hong-1 put its nation alongside the US, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and France as the only five countries to have ever launched anything into space. China's entry into that exclusive club had been a long time in the making, and it hadn't come easily. First adopted by Mao Zedong in 1958, the idea that China should attempt to place an artificial satellite in orbit was a massive undertaking. This was made especially true since it coincided with the disastrous Great Leap Forward, which would see the deaths of millions of people in China over the next several years. But it was technically feasible to achieve, and for the next 12 years, a task force based at the Chinese Academy of Sciences set to work making it happen. Under the leadership of Chinese scientist Qian Zhuzhen, who had been educated in the United States before being expelled during the Red Scare of the 1940s and 50s, China's team of space scientists slowly grew. Tightly linked with China's nuclear weapons program, for which Zhu Zhen was also instrumental, this space program would develop the Long March series of rockets. Similar to the United States and Soviet Russia, China's first launch vehicles were based on ballistic missiles, although they would grow far more sophisticated as time went on. By the time of their first successful launch in 1970, China's rocket scientists and engineers were already thinking about how to put their first man in space, and just a year later, they selected 19 astronaut candidates to train and compete for that honor. But like many groups and initiatives over the course of modern Chinese history, there's no stopping the Communist Party when its sights are set on an internal enemy. In the years of the Cultural Revolution, that internal enemy was China's intellectual class, including many of its best scientists and engineers. Though the space program held on for years, eventually the pressure of the revolution was just too much, and as their leaders were dismissed from their posts, the program's astronaut trainees were sent packing. Before long, China had just a shadow of a space program, the last remnants of which was abolished in 1980. Twelve years later, China was in a very different position. A stable political situation had brought with it a stable, growing economy, and the recent collapse of the Soviet Union had left something of a vacuum in the communist world. China's hardliners had just reaffirmed their control over the nation, but with an acute awareness of the hunger for progress and modernity that many of China's billion-plus citizens were feeling. The technological innovation inherent to a space program had begun to look very appealing for the Communist Party, who recognized the many direct and fringe benefits to such a bold scientific program. From this came Project 921, China's reborn aspiration to reach out into space, and more importantly, to see it firsthand. It was designated as such for the year it was launched, 1992, and with a suffix of one to indicate that it was 1992's first major national initiative. 
His long mission was broken into three phases, each of which would take years, if not decades, to complete. In phase one, China would launch an unmanned spacecraft and learn everything it needed to know in theory to put a living, breathing human into space. In phase two, China's astronauts, referred to as Taikonauts, would learn how to get back and forth from orbit, perform spacewalks, dock their modules, and prepare facilities for a short-term space station. And in phase three, China would construct its own space station from which it could support a crewed mission in the long term. It was a bold plan, overseen by the newly founded China National Space Administration, and although it could take some inspiration from Russian and American designs, China would have to develop and manufacture its own technology in order to realize its objectives. But the nation's scientists were up to the task, and with a team jointly assembled from some of the best minds within government and private industry, they set to work. In order to visit space, you've got to get out of Earth's orbit, and China's early answer to that problem was the Long March 2F, a two-stage rocket 62 meters in length with four strap-on booster rockets and a payload of 8,400 kilograms. The 2F was intended to be a human-safe improvement on the Long March 2 family of rockets. Its predecessor, the Long March 2E, was largely a failure of design and had damaged several satellites on the way into space. So in order to make the 2F a rocket that anyone in their right mind would even consider Boarding, it had to be overhauled for safety purposes. Within the Long March 2F, Chinese engineers designed the Shenzhou Space Capsule, based largely on technology from the Russian Soyuz capsule. In 1995, Russia provided major support for the Chinese program, including actual modules for replication. The Shenzhou capsule is visually similar to the Soyuz, although its larger size and range of changes to its inner components set it apart from the older craft. The capsule consists of three modules, a forward orbital module with its own system of propulsion, an aft service module, and a capsule for re-entry to the Earth's surface. The capsule's launch escape system was developed fully by Chinese scientists, and by the end of 1998, the rocket and the prototype spacecraft were ready for a first test. During the same time, China had been hard at work identifying its first Taikonauts. Two military pilots, Wu Ji and Li Qinlong, were selected for training in Russia in 1996, and two years later, 14 pilots were identified for candidacy. To support them, the Beijing Aerospace Flight Control Center was opened in 1998. China's first launch of the craft came on November 20, 1999, when the Shenzhou-1 prototype craft lifted off from a launch pad in Jianquan. There was no crew in the vessel at the time, and the objective was simple. Get it into orbit and bring it back home. The mission was a success, and the return capsule touched down in Mongolia just a day later. The next launch wouldn't take place for over a year, but in early 2001, the Shenzhou-2 spent seven days orbiting the Earth before touching down safely. The craft had hosted a number of microgravity experiments, as well as a monkey, a dog, and a rabbit, and several mice in order to test the module's life support systems. The animals all survived re-entry. The third and fourth missions, both held in 2002, were also deemed a success. The third carried a dummy that simulated basic human physiology functions, while the fourth carried two dummies and all the equipment necessary for a crewed flight. On the 15th of October, 2003, the big day finally came. Taikonaut Yang Liwei was strapped into the Shenzhou 5, and just six minutes after takeoff, he and his capsule entered orbit of the Earth. 21 hours later, Yang landed safely in Mongolia, and with his arrival back on the surface, China became only the third nation in history to put a human being in space and bring them back down safely, all on their own. It was an absolutely massive, historic achievement, one that the world applauded nearly unanimously on its scientific merit. And it was an achievement that set off a cascade of Chinese advancements as their space program moved into phase two. In the coming years, China would launch two more missions to space, both using the Long March 2F to get the job done. In October 2005, two Taikonauts spent five days in space before returning safely, and in September 2008, three of China's space explorers carried out their first ever spacewalk. These launches provided China with opportunities to make a range of changes and alterations to their standard operating procedures, and the Shenzhou modules had a number of improvements focused on safety, livability, and boosted capacity to host scientific experiments. The China's Manned Spaceflight Initiative wasn't the only program going on at this time, and on November 5, 2007, China's first lunar orbiter entered the moon's gravity well. Another one uh, would be launched just under three years later, and while China's manned and unmanned space programs fed off each other, they also competed for a limited pool of resources. But just because a limited number of manned space flights took place during these years doesn't mean that the scientists and Taikonauts behind the program weren't hard at work. In fact, it was just the opposite. 
In these few short years, the hope was that the experience gained from the first seven Shenzhou missions would provide enough critical information to fuel China's next set of goals, to lay the groundwork for a short-term habitable space station. This initiative led to China's first in the Tiangong series of spacecraft. With the name translating to Heavenly Palace, the Tiangong 1 space station would be the experimental craft on which China would test its docking systems and scientific tools. It would also help to further cement China's status alongside Russia and the United States since Russia's Salyut and Mir space stations and the United States' Skylab had been major spacefaring achievements of their own. By this time, the International Space Station had been continually occupied for years, and with Mir recently deorbited and brought back to Earth, China had the opportunity to become the world's only country with an actively inhabited national space station of its own. Over the course of several years, China's scientists and engineers designed and assembled the Tiangong 1. At a weight of 8,500 kilograms, 10.5 meters long by 3.5 wide, it was just a bit larger than the Shenzhou spacecraft, still restrained by the structure of the Long March rockets that O would bring it into orbit. Inside, Tiangon 1 had two sections, a pressurized module in the front where Taikonauts were meant to live for the duration of their time in space, and an unpressurized module in the back where its propulsion system would be housed. The vessel was solar-powered and contained ergonomic and safety features for its travelers to the extent that such things could fit on such a small craft. The craft was launched into space in September 2011, where it established orbit 350 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Once there, it was used as a test bed for one of the most potentially catastrophic steps in spaceflight, and one that China absolutely couldn't get wrong if lives were on the line. The craft had to dock with a Shenzhou vessel, and just a month after entering orbit, it would do just that. The Shenzhou 8 was sent to rendezvous with Tiangong 1, uncrewed and under ground control. Upon arrival, the transport craft docked with the station during orbital darkness, and maintained docking for 12 days, and then undocked, after which a second rendezvous and docking took place in sunlight. A biological sample provided by Germany and the European Space Agency was present for the entire flight and was kept alive during the docking process. The mission was a resounding success and proved that Taikonauts could safely be sent to the Tiangong 1. The mission also finalized the design of the Shenzhou line of spacecraft, and since this mission, no crafts have been significantly modified from the design of Shenzhou 8. With all systems go, China had two years to work with Tiangong before it was scheduled to be decommissioned. On the Shenzhou 9, three Taikonauts became the first crew to rendezvous with their space station, where they stayed for a successful mission lasting several days. Among their number was Liu Yang, the first Chinese woman to travel to space, alongside Liu Wang and Commander Jing Haipeng. Then, riding to space on the Shenzhou 10, another group of three Taikonauts would live for two full weeks on the station, conducting medical and technological experiments. Also on this trip, Wang Yiping, China's second woman in space, would teach a science lesson that was broadcast live to 60 million Chinese students. After this group, the Tiangong 1 entered its manned service, and it would be monitored for several years unmanned before re-entering Earth's atmosphere in April 2018, when it, like other stations of its size, split into a whole bunch of little pieces and burned up. But by this time, its successor craft, the Tiangong 2, was already in orbit, where it had been since 2016. With the same design parameters as its predecessor, this space station was visited by humans only once, with a team of two Taikonauts spending 33 days in orbit with the help of Shenzhou 11. During their stay, they acclimated to space, recorded their experiences, and most importantly, they didn't die, thus demonstrating the craft's ability to maintain life support for an entire month. Tiangong 2 also performed a second unmanned mission in 2017 when it hosted an unmanned resupply vessel, the Tianzhou 1. Much like the previous unmanned rendezvous, this was a chance for a new class of spacecraft to demonstrate that it could safely interact with the space station using the docking technology and procedures that China had put on board. This test, too, was a success, and when Tiangong 2 reached the end of its service life in 2019, it came down in the same way as its predecessor, burning up in a quiet, lonely, atmospheric cremation. Now, after years with habitable space stations in orbit, it may be tempting to dismiss Tiangong 1 and 2 as a bit wasteful, considering that between them they hosted only seven Taikonauts, completed only five successful rendezvous missions, and spent less than two cumulative months inhabited. But in truth, these two craft were in service to a far broader goal, one which China had now checked off every necessary box to approve. With station docking, rendezvous, life support, and the human effects of spaceflight all worked out, China was ready to build its permanent space station. This was the Tiangong, no numbers needed, as it would be the first, last, and only permanent vessel, and if all went well, it would place a magnificent capstone on China's decade-long quest.
Compared to the two prior Tiangong models, the new station would be a behemoth. First revealed in 2018, the station's design included three modules. The Tianhe, which would form the core of the station, and two additional modules, the Wentian and the Mengtian. The Tiany core module was approximately the size of a bus all by itself, and in addition to full living quarters for the crew, it would include the power, propulsion, and life support mechanisms for the station, as well as a docking hub to receive visiting Shenzhou craft. The Wentian module provided backup versions of all the essential bits and bobs needed to keep the Tychonauts alive, as well as an independent airlock that they could use to exit the station and begin a spacewalk. The Wentian also established three more living quarters for short-term residents and contained ample laboratory space. The Mentian module greatly expanded the station's capacity to host experiments, as well as adding additional communications features and a cargo airlock for unmanned supply craft. Each experimental module has a different focus. The Wentian is for life sciences, while the Mentian hosts microgravity experiments. The core Tianhe module was brought to space in 2001 on a much improved rocket system, Long March 5, which was built to carry heavier payloads into orbit. An uncrewed Tianzhou vessel delivered the supplies needed to host a living crew in orbit, and on June 17, 2021, the Shengzhou 12 docked with the Tiangong, delivering three Taikonauts for a stay of 90 days. This crew performed two spacewalks and spent much of their time installing equipment, testing technology, and performing basic experiments that would confirm China's understanding of the effects of a long-term stay in microgravity. Their mission, too, was a success, and just a month later, Shenzhou 13 brought another crew to the station. These three Taikonauts were of special importance to the overall Chinese mission, as it was these three who would be the first to complete a stay of a full six months on board the Tiangong. From this point forward, all crews were to expect a six-month stay, marking the end of the exploratory, proof-of-concept crew survival test that had guided China up to this point. Yet again, the mission was a success, and the next crew, the Shenzhou 14, would complete their own six-month stay, which ended just five days before the script was written. The crew oversaw the addition of the Wentian and Mentian laboratories to the overall Tiangong structure. On the 24th of July 2022, the Wentian was docked with the station, and on the 31st of October, the Mentian joined as well. The crew also performed a number of different spacewalks to get both modules fully set up. The next group arrived on Shengzhou 15 on November 29, 2022, and as of the time of writing, Taikonauts Fei Zhonglong, Den Qing Ming, and Zhang Lu are still up there, carrying on the mission of the space travelers that preceded them. It's hard to say exactly what is in store for the Chinese space program from here on out, but we do know some basics for sure. Shenzhou missions will continue to run to and from Tiangong with a continuous crew of at least three members at a given time, and a resupply by the unmanned cargo vessels will also continue to go. The station will also rendezvous with China's new telescope, where it will supply a refuel using the Tiangong's power sources. Taikonauts will continue running experiments, broadcasting science lessons back to Chinese students, and conducting spacewalks to put the finishing touches on the station. And more of them will be trained as well to replace the aging first and second generations of space explorers. In the coming years, China hopes that Tiangong will replace the International Space Station as the world's premier space station. The ISS is due for decommission in 2031, and Chinese Taikonauts are currently barred from the station by default as the United States' NASA organization is strictly prohibited from sharing data with China. If there is no replacement available by that time, though, America's desire to continue sending astronauts to space might just supersede its rule against data sharing. Beyond this, many Western onlookers speculate that China's space program may form a more and more instrumental part of Xi Jinping's Chinese dream as time goes on. Whether this will include components of militarization in space remains to be seen. And China's ambitions in space are far from satisfied. The state's media organizations become very clear about their goals for the decades ahead, and on a tight timeline, they hope to bring Taikonauts to territory that no human has walked before. By 2025, China hopes to collect samples from near-Earth asteroids, followed by a sample return mission to Mars in 2030. In the same year, China claims it will land Taikonauts on the moon, while also sending an unmanned probe to Jupiter. In 2033, it will be Mars's turn to host Chinese Taikonauts, who, on that timetable, will be the first humans to ever witness the Red Planet in person. By 2035, China aims to have a series of reusable carrier rockets to replace the existing Long March designs, and their goal of a nuclear-powered space shuttle is to be realized 
by 2040. According to China, it aims to be a leading space power by 2045, with further missions to Mars and exploration of the outer solar system sure to follow. In the much nearer term, the Tiangong might also be receiving some new upgrades and a dramatic expansion to its current size. One key design feature to the station is that its core module has an extra docking station from which a new module can be added, and if that new module has an extra docking station of its own, it can add another module after that. Start to add more and more docking stations on a hypothetical new module, and it's easy to imagine how the station could conceivably be expanded outward in three dimensions. Speculation for the planned new modules includes an improvement on the available living space and amenities for the Tychonauts, plus an additional set of redundancies for the life support and propulsion systems on board. A clear plan for if and when this expansion will take place is still unknown. And so at present, that's it. China's 30-year mission to put man in space from its humble beginnings to its impressive current state of affairs. Across 15 launches of the Shengzhou craft, China has been able to not just get people into orbit, but put them on space stations, keep them alive, and most importantly, bring them home safely. China has certainly had its setbacks, including launch and orbital failures in 2020 and 2021, but those were failures of the Long March rockets. The Shengzhou transports, the unmanned cargo vessels, the Tiangong's predecessors, and the permanent station itself have all been safe, reliable, and by and large they've done exactly what they were supposed to do with no significant failures of design or engineering. It's important to add a caveat here, that there's a lot about the Chinese space program that we still don't know, and might never know. But when talking about the kind of disasters and fatalities that the Soviet and American space programs had to endure, it's clear to see that China has been able to avoid similar outcomes. Some of this is likely from the shared benefits of hindsight, loaned Russian data, and clear examples of what not to do. But regardless, China's manned spaceflight program has a near spotless safety record. As this mission continues, there's no telling precisely what China will choose to do with its new abilities as a spacefaring nation. And in today's world, it's hard to imagine an outcome in which China's eventual choices don't have some serious geopolitical ramifications. But for all the mucking about we humans do on Earth, there's something to be said for the sheer magnitude of China's accomplishments in space. Accomplishments that, much like American and Russian endeavors to the same, offer something to all of humanity. Whether aboard Tiangon, on missions to the moon or Mars, or on whatever great expeditions await in our future, the future of Project 921 may well play an instrumental role in the future of the human species itself.